All right, we are going to be picking up where we left off, chapter 14. I don't know about you guys, but I'm excited. I'm actually really excited to be through chapter 13 because chapter 13 is kind of hard. Um, but it's it's important. It's, it's good for us to know what's coming and it's good for us to know that uh, that we have something to expect and look for. And actually, this is something that we talked about on Wednesday. Um, we always have great discussion on Wednesday, but this this past Wednesday was was great because we were talking about all the different signs and things that are going to be taking place, and when the beast is going to show up, and all this stuff. And it's like, okay, what do we need to look for, right? Like, if if we are living in the end times. And we are going to be experiencing what we're reading. What do we need to look for to know that it's coming? Like, you know, how do we know that we're, it's actually going to happen in our generation? So we talked about that. And, and I think that's really important for us to know. And if you want to know, you have to come on Wednesday. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but but we, we did talk about that. And, we, um, and, and it, was, it was good discussion. We are going to talk a little bit about that today. But, well, let's just... Let's just um, let me recap a little bit for those who maybe have missed a little bit. In chapter 13, John is seeing a vision of the dragon, the devil, giving his authority and his power to these two beasts in this vision. The first beast we saw in the beginning was a nation, and it had 10 kings, and there will be an 11th king, and that is the Antichrist. He's the one who's going to conquer the earth and wage war on the church and on Israel. He's going to make a covenant with Israel, and then he's going to break the covenant and wage war uh, with Israel. The other beast that we saw is the false prophet, and we actually see him identified as the false prophet later in Revelation. He's not given that title in this chapter, but in, the, in later uh, chapters, he's called the false prophet. And this false prophet will do signs and wonders to mislead and deceive the world into worshiping the first beast, the nation, right, and the Antichrist. And so um, we're going to see him doing that. This beast, the false prophet, is going to institute a global religious and economic system requiring the mark of the beast. And that's actually how chapter 13 ends with the identification of the mark of the beast. And so we talked a little bit about that last week. Um, we just need to, as, as the church, we need to continue reading and, and hearing what's, what the book of Revelation says and heeding what it says so that we can, we can know what to expect and so that we can be blessed because really ultimately what we're reading, especially today, really gives us the reason why Jesus gave the Great Commission to the church. So we're going to talk about that today. But uh, let's read from, uh, from the book of Revelation. We're going, to, we're going to start chapter 14 this week. Uh, we're not going to finish chapter 14. We're going to finish it next week. But why don't you guys stand for the reading of the Word of God? And we're going to begin in Revelation chapter 14, verses 1 through 5. It says this, then I looked, and behold, the Lamb was standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his name and the name of his Father written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, like the sound of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder, and the voice which I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. And no one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been purchased from the earth. These are the ones who have not been defiled with women, for they have kept themselves chaste. These are the ones who follow the lamb wherever he goes. These have been purchased from among men as the first fruits to God and to the lamb. And no lie was found in their mouth. They are blameless. Let's pray. God, we are grateful for your blessings. We're grateful, Lord, for this revelation. And we're grateful, Lord, that we know that you are returning. And so, God, I pray that as we, we get through this first portion of chapter 14, that you would enlighten our hearts and our minds to recognize both 
your coming and the need to share the gospel. We thank you for your blessings. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you may be seated. So as a reminder, what we saw in chapter 13 is the Great Tribulation. We talked about it over the last two weeks, but the Great Tribulation period occurs during a specific time where certain things are going to happen and they must happen. And they must happen the way that the Bible is describing. So there have been times where people have thought that it was the Great Tribulation. World War II is actually kind of famous for that among um, not really the early church, but the church earlier than us, because they really thought that World War II was this occurring, right? Especially because the Holocaust against the Jews and all that stuff. But there are things, um, there are things that were not happening during the World War II era that really need to happen in order to fulfill this scripture. The, the, the prophecy of the Great Tribulation. And we see in chapter 13, verse 10, that the war against the believers actually is the perseverance and the faith of the saints. So that what that means is, is that, um, that true believers must persevere and not submit to the deception of the devil, because that is something that is going to happen during the Great Tribulation period. There's going to be widespread deception, and there's going to be widespread uh, religious zeal away from God. So if you guys were here last week, you'll kind of remember that, uh, that that's what the second beast is all about. He's all about misleading the world, performing great signs and wonders, being a false prophet, a false Christ, misleading people to worship the beast. And so we look at that, and John, John tells his readers about the number of the name of the beast, which in, in most translations is 666. And we talked a little bit about that last week. I'm not going to get into that again today. But he tells his readers about this number, and then he looked and saw the lamb. And the lamb was standing on Mount Zion. Now, that is significant. I know in... in what we just read in verse one, it's just very quick. Behold, on Mount Zion stood the lamb and then with him the 144,000. It's almost like an afterthought. But the cool thing about this is that this is actually a fulfillment of prophecy that we as Christians should know about. We should be aware of the prophecy that talks about Jesus's return. Now, the last time that we saw the lamb or that John saw the lamb in the book of Revelation was in chapter eight. And that was when he broke the seventh seal that was on the scroll that he took from the father. But in the previous chapter, in chapter seven, we actually see the lamb in the throne room of heaven and he's surrounded by this great multitude of people. And we're told in chapter seven, verse 14, that this great multitude are believers who came out of the Great Tribulation. And so what we're seeing here is that chronologically speaking then, chapter 17, or excuse me, chapter 7 takes place after the Great Tribulation and after chapter 13, chronologically speaking. So you guys see why now this can be so confusing for some people to go through? And I don't know if you've ever had the chance to kind of go through Revelation yourself, but it can be a bit. And that's one of the reasons why I came up with the timeline that I did. And again, it's not fully 100% accurate. As a matter of fact, I've mentioned before, but there's a couple things that I would change personally on there now. But we're going to look at that in just a second. But that's why I made it. Oh, there it is. But that's okay. Um, but that's why I made it because it's like, well, wait a minute. When does this happen? And when does this happen? Right? And we can't figure out all these different things. So chronologically, chapter 7 is taking place after, right? The sealing of the 144,000 takes place after the Great Tribulation. But it takes place before chapter 14. And that's why we're talking about that today. That's, that's one of the reasons why I'm bringing this up. Also, we see that um, if we look at the timing of the sixth seal being broken in Revelation chapter 6, um, 
we uh, if if you if you go back to Matthew twenty four, it tells you it tells us that immediately after the tribulation of those days, and then it gives a description of what will happen. The sun will go dark, the moon will not give off its light, the stars will fall, the heavens will be shaken, earthquake, all this stuff. That's the sign that comes with the breaking of the sixth seal. And so that also confirms our timing of when the tribulation is and when these things are taking place. And again, that's why I made the timeline, right? Because it's like, oh my gosh, there's all kinds of stuff happening. So why don't we pull the timeline up real quick? So we had a zoomed in version of this because there's just a lot happening. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this with me. And I'm going to take this with me. Yeah, probably not. You guys can hear me. But I'm recording, so I need to take this with me. So what we're looking at is this area right here. This is the section right here that we're looking at. And we talked about the beasts, and that's these guys right here. They break the covenant. There's the great tribulation period for three and a half years. And then the breaking of the sixth seal, which I was just talking about. When you have all those signs happening, the sun, the moon, the stars, the earthquake, all the everything, right? And if you guys were here when we talked about chapter six, you'll remember that the people actually hid themselves in the rocks and in the caves because they knew that it was the day of the Lord. They knew that it was the coming of his wrath, right? And so that's happening right here. There's actually an, I just discovered this yesterday. There's actually an Old Testament scripture that talks about people hiding themselves from the day of the Lord in caves. And I'm like, I've never read that before. That's fascinating. It's in the Old Testament. It's not just in Revelation, it's in the Old Testament too. So anyway, so you'll see here 144,000 sealed. That's Revelation chapter seven. And then the seventh seal is broken. That was Revelation chapter eight. So we just talked about that, right? That's when the lamb was seen. Now what we're seeing though, what we're, what we're seeing in chapter 14 is actually way over here because it's when Christ returns. And we're going to talk about that right here when the first resurrection occurs. Um, that's when Christ returns. So we're going, to, we're going to talk a little bit about that today. We're going to get a glimpse of that today. But that's why we're talking about all this, because it helps us. We look at the, um, we look at the timeline and we're able to kind of see, okay, now I can grasp where all this is happening. Now, Let's talk a little bit about his return. The lamb is standing on Mount Zion. And we actually have some cross-references that talk about his return to Mount Zion. Because if you guys remember when we were, when we were kind of diving in a little bit to Matthew 24, he's talking to his disciples about his return. He's talking about the end of the age, really. But at the end of that, he talks about his return. And when he says that, then it's, he says that the world is going to see that the Son of Man is coming back in the clouds. And there's a gathering. And we're going we're gonna to get into that a little bit more next week when we talk about the reaping. Um, and that's actually, we're going to talk about the rapture, this, this concept of rapture. We're going to dive into that a little bit more next week. But what we also see both in the Old and the New Testament is that there are these prophecies of Christ. when Christ returns, he's going to touch down on the Mount of Olives, which is Mount Zion. It's, it's the same thing. It's the same area. And so there's a couple, there's a couple cross-references here that I'd like to read with you. Um, in Romans chapter 11, this is Paul speaking to the church in Rome. He's talking about the Jews, and he's talking about salvation for the Jews, and he's talking about how they've rejected the Messiah for the sake of the Gentiles receiving salvation. But this is what he says near the end of that. He says, for I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation, that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved, just as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. 
This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. From the standpoint of the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, for our sake. But from the standpoint of God's choice, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. And the fathers that he's referring to is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Because God made a covenant with them that he would bless his people. They would be his chosen people. And if we read the section before this, we see that we as Gentiles, because part of the plan, the mystery, have been grafted into the promise and the nation, the chosen people of Israel, right? We're not replacing Israel. We've been grafted in. That, so kind of understand that a little bit. That's, that's what he's talking about there. But I wanted you guys to see that the deliverer is going to come from Zion and he's going to remove ungodliness from Jacob, which is another name for the nation of Israel, right? Because the, the, their forefather, Jacob, was renamed to Israel by God after they wrestled together. He changed his name to Israel. And that's actually why the nation of Israel is called Israel. So let's take a look at uh, a couple of Old Testament verses here. And this is what it talks about. This, this, is, this is the renewal of Israel in the Old Testament. These are the scriptures that Israel currently is looking for fulfillment of. This is what they're, they're looking for their Messiah to fulfill these prophecies. And I want you guys to keep in the back of your head what we've already read. It says, therefore, to the house of Israel, or say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you went. I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God. When I prove myself holy among you in their sight. For I will take you from the nations, gather you from all the lands, and bring you into your own land. That's already happened. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. You will live in the land that I gave you to your forefathers, gave to your forefathers. So you will be my people, and I will be your God. Now that sounds a little bit like that's already happened, right? Except it hasn't happened for the Jews. See, that promise is specifically for the Jews, although what he's describing giving us a clean heart and put, giving us his spirit has already happened to us. And that's the whole point of what Paul was referring to back in Romans 11, is that because there's been a hardening of Israel, salvation has come to the Gentiles. We have salvation. We have access to that. And you might be saying, what does that have to do with Mount Zion? I'm getting there. Now we're going to jump over to Zechariah chapter 14. Now, we're going to actually go through quite a bit of this, but there's a reason for it. Because I want you guys to understand that what we're reading corresponds with what we're reading in Revelation. It's very, very important. And we're actually going to look at this again next week as well. But I want you guys to check this out because this is fulfilled in Revelation. It says this, behold, Zechariah chapter 14, starting at verse 1, behold. A day is coming for the Lord when the spoil taken from you, Israel, will be divided among you. For I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city will be captured. We've heard that before. The houses plundered, the women ravished, and half the city exiled, but the rest of the people will not be cut off from the city. This kind of harkens back to Revelation chapter 11, right? When we looked at we saw John and he was given that measuring rod and he was told to measure the temple, but leave the outer courts because it was going to be trampled by the Gentiles. That's what this is referring to. 
the city being taken. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. In that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in front of Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives will be split in its middle from east to west by a very large valley so that half of the mountain will move toward the north and the other half to the south. And then he's talking about um, Israel now when he says this, you will flee by, my, by the valley of my mountains for the valley of the mountains will reach Azale. Yes, you will flee just as you fled before the earthquake in the, day, the days of Uzziah, the king of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come and all the holy ones with him. You guys catch that? The Lord will come and all his holy ones with him. In that day, there will be no light. The luminaries will dwindle. For it will be a unique day, which is known to the Lord, neither day nor night. But it will come about that at evening time, there will be light. We'll get into that later in Revelation. In that day, living waters will flow out of Jerusalem, half of them toward the eastern sea, the other half toward the western sea. And it will be summer as well as in winter. Now. Let's finish this real quick. Well, actually, okay. I'm going to skip that for now. <clears throat> so one more, one more cross-reference I want you guys to check out. And then I'll get into the details here. This is in the book of Isaiah, chapter 2. The word which Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Now it will come about that in the last days, the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains and will be raised above the hills and all the nations will stream to it. And many people will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us concerning his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For the law will go forth from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he will judge between the nations and will render decisions for many people, and they will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, and never again will they learn war. This is a picture of when Christ is reigning, and he's reigning from Jerusalem. And I wanted you guys to check this out because it says that the mountain of the house of the Lord will be raised up. If you guys remember, when Christ returns, when the sign of the coming of the Son of Man happens, it actually says that there will be mountains that are moved out of their places. And there's going to be earthquakes, and there's going to be all kinds of, of geological shifting. That is actually what this is referring to. And there's another section, I, I can't remember if I included it or not, because there's a ton of cross-references for this. But there's another section that talks about how Mount Zion will be raised up and all the surrounding land will be flattened. So there will be no other mountains surrounding it. And this is fascinating because what we're seeing here, we're just seeing a quick picture here, just a glimpse of it in chapter 14. But the lamb is standing on Mount Zion. And we read in Zechariah that when he comes down, when his foot, foot touches down on the Mount of Olives, it's going to split in half. That's incredible. That's, I mean, it's just it's unbelievable. But now he's standing on Mount Zion, fulfillment of scripture, and he has the 144,000 with him. Now, we talked a little bit about them in chapter seven. We were introduced to them in chapter seven. We learned in chapter seven that they are bond servants of God, and that they're sealed on their foreheads with the seal of God. We also learned that they are Jews. They're 12,000 men from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. So they're Jews. That means we don't qualify. Now we see that they are with the lamb in Jerusalem. And we get a little bit more description of them. They have this song that only they know and they sing. And they sing it before the lamb. We know that they are chaste. Which means that they're virgins. They haven't been with a woman. They follow the lamb wherever he goes. And they were purchased by the lamb as first fruits to God. And finally, they did not lie and they're blameless. 
this is a qualification for men, which is, you're hard pressed to find this, right? So, but I will say this, during this time, during the time of the great tribulation, they will be identified. These are going to actually, these are going to actually be Jewish men who fulfill this section of scripture and they will go with the lamb. There are a lot of people that actually want to um, make this kind of an analogy or a symbol. Uh, there are people that say, well, it's not a literal 144,000. It's, it's kind of, you know, it's representing the church or whatever, you know. The issue, though, and I mentioned this back when we talked about them in chapter 7, is that there are very specific things about these men that make them qualify for being part of 144,000. So I think a literal interpretation of this is probably the best way to go. Now, let's move on from them, because we did already kind of talk about them a little bit in chapter 7. I don't want to I don't want to spend too much time on them. So we're going to move forward in chapter 14. So we're in Revelation chapter 14 again, verses 6 through 8. And I saw another angel flying in mid heaven, having an eternal gospel to preach to those who live on the earth and to every nation and tribe and tongue and people. And he said with a loud voice, fear God and give, give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and the springs of water. And another angel, a second one, followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She who has made all the nations drink of the wine of the passion of her immorality. So let's, let's get a, a, a picture here. Let's grasp this scene. John is seeing Mount Zion. And he sees the lamb and the 144,000 standing on Mount Zion. And then in the sky, that's what the mid heaven is. In the sky, he sees an angel go by. And the angel is flying and the angel preaches the gospel to the entire earth. Now, this is actually really significant because up until this point, it has been the job of the church to preach the gospel. Up until this point in time, and remember, we've gone through the Great Tribulation, right? And if you guys remember back to chapter 12, we're the ones who overcome the dragon by the word of our testimony and by the blood of the Lamb, right? So, so we're the ones who are preaching the gospel. It's our job to preach the gospel. But in this particular case now, there's an angel that's flying overhead preaching the gospel to the entire earth. And there is now, at this point, no excuse for the people who reject God. Because not only have we, the church, done our job and sent the gospel all around the world. In fact, it actually says in Matthew 24, if you recall, it actually says that the gospel will be preached to the ends of the earth and then the end will come. So that means the Great Tribulation won't even happen until the gospel has spread to the entire world, right? But if that's not enough, now there's an angel proclaiming the gospel, telling people to repent and to worship God. So there really is no excuse for the people that reject God at this point. They've heard it from us. They've heard it from an angel. They've seen it also in creation. We actually see this in Romans chapter 1. I'm going to read this to you guys. Romans chapter 1, starting at verse 18, it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. We see creation protestify to God's eternal power and his invisible attributes and divine nature. 
They are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Therefore, God gave them over in the lust of their heart to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them for they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And so there is no excuse. And in fact, there really is no excuse for those who reject God now. Because we see here in Romans that he has revealed himself through creation. That we can know that there is a creator God. We can see it in creation around us. We can see it within ourselves. All we have to do is look at ourselves and realize that there's something greater than us. Right? I am not God. You are not God. There's got to be something greater. There's got to be something more. Now, there is a second angel following behind the first, and it is declaring that Babylon the Great is now fallen at this time. We're not going to look at that right now. We're going to see that more in depth in Revelation chapter 16 through 18. And it will actually explain who or what Babylon the Great is. So we'll save that for then. But now we have a third angel. We're going to read, we're going to finish chapter, uh, this, at least the section that we're in, in chapter 13. We're going to finish that right now. There's a third angel. It says in verse 9, another angel, a third one followed the other two, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also will drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger. And he will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. They have no rest day and night, those who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. Here, is the perseverance of the saints who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, so that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow with them. Now that is some heavy stuff, but... We are seeing now that this third angel is proclaiming judgment. He's giving a warning on those who are on the earth who took the mark of the beast, that they would suffer God's wrath if they took the mark of the beast. This is a, this is a warning and it's a declaration. But at this point now, it's already too late for those who took the mark. Because remember, this is taking place after the Great Tribulation. And during the Great Tribulation is when the mark of the beast is given. And so now he is proclaiming God's wrath against those who have taken it. This is heavy. This is hard to deal with. And actually, um, this is describing what, what we envision as being hell. But this is the true hell. We're going to get into that in just a second. But this is why believers must refuse to bow the knee to the beast. This is why we as believers must refuse the mark if we are to stay faithful. Those who receive the mark are not written in the Lamb's book of life. And so they are going to suffer God's wrath. Obviously, this is not pleasant to, to talk about. This is not pleasant to read. This is not pleasant to think about. But this is why it says this is the perseverance of the saints. This is their faith. Those who take the mark of the beast will suffer torment in what we see later called the lake of fire. 
That's how it's described later in Revelation. It's, it's called the lake of fire. This is the final and eternal punishment for those who reject God and his free gift of grace. Now, this is a hot button topic within Christianity today, especially because there are some people that teach that there is no hell. In fact, several years ago, there was a, a, a large debate about this because a well-known teacher actually wrote a book called, I think it's called Love Wins. Yeah. And, um, and he actually said in that book that God will spare all humanity from this torment because love wins. And then there was a book that answered that, and I don't remember the name of that, but it actually answered that, and it talked about the reality of eternal punishment. And I'm going to give you just a few verses, just a few, that talk about the doctrine of hell. Because as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, as true believers, Bible-believing Christians, we need to recognize that this is taught in Scripture. As unpalatable as it may be, God's judgment on the unrighteous is taught in Scripture, and we need to not only believe it, but we need to recognize that it's there for a reason. Now, Jesus himself taught about this in Matthew chapter 13. We're going to have this up on the screen for you. He gave a parable to the people, and it had to do with the wheat and the tares. And so starting at verse 36, it says, Then he left the crowds and went into the house. And his disciples came to him and said, explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. Now he said, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. That's him. And the field is the world. And as for, as for the good seed, these are the sons of the kingdom and the tares are the sons of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. And the harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. We're actually going to talk about that in depth next week. That's actually in Revelation chapter 14. So just as the tares are gathered up and burned with fire, so shall it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send forth his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks, and those who commit lawlessness... And will throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. That is the words of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And this is the reason why he came. Because if he had not come to the earth and died on the cross, we would all be tares. We would all be deserving God's wrath and his judgment. Now, there's a, there's a cross-reference here that we've read multiple times in Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. We've read it multiple times, but I want to read this again because of what Jesus just said. Now, at the time of the end, the end of the Great Tribulation, it says, Michael, the great prince who stands guard over the, the sons of your people, will arise. And there will be a time of distress such as has never occurred since there was a nation until that time. And at that time, your people, which is Israel, and it says, everyone who is found written in the book will be rescued. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake, these to everlasting life, but the others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. You guys see the distinction here? There's two groups. What's being described is the resurrection. And we're going to talk about that. We see that in Revelation further. But I want you guys to grasp this. I want you to catch this. There's, there's a resurrection of everybody. Some to everlasting life. Some to everlasting contempt. And then it says, those who have insight will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heaven. And those who lead the many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Jesus just referenced that in, at the end of that explanation. But I want you guys to see that the resurrection is an integral part of that. <clears throat> now let's, let's continue looking at, at the wrath of God. 
Psalm 75, verses 7 and 8. It says this, but God is the judge. He puts down one and exalts the other. For a cup is in the hand of the Lord and the wine foams. It is well mixed and he pours out of this. Surely all the wicked of the earth must drain and drink down its drinks. That's in Psalms. That's part of a song of worship to the Lord. They're recognizing that God is going to pour out his wrath on those who are wicked. Now, there's another section here in Matthew 25. We've been in Matthew 24 a lot, but we never really go past that. But there's a section here where Jesus is talking about something probably you guys are fairly familiar with. In, in Matthew 25, verses 31 through 33, Jesus says, But when the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them from one another, as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. I'm sure you guys have heard this before, right? And it talks about the sheep, and, and, and he says, welcome to your reward, because you clothed me, and you fed me, and you visited me in prison. And they're like, when have you done this? And when you did it to the least of these, you did it to me. And then we jump down to verse 41. And it says this. Then he will say also to those on his left, depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. This is very interesting because this is telling us something about the eternal fire. What it's telling us is, is that the eternal fire was originally meant for the devil and his angels. It wasn't meant for us. But we see in, we also see in Jude chapter six, or excuse me, Jude chapter one, there's only one chapter in Jude, verse six, but it says, it says that uh, it's, well, I'll just read it to you. It'll make more sense after I read it. And angels who did not keep their own domain, but abandoned their proper abode, he has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, since they in the same way as these indulged in gross immorality and went after strange flesh, are exhibited as an example in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. And so the interesting thing about this is that we see that the, the lake of fire, as it's described in Revelation, was originally intended for the devil and his angels. But when man fell now, there needed to be a place where the, unrighteousness, the unrighteous would go. And so they too now also are following in the footsteps of the devil and his angels and will be going to the same location, the lake of fire. And he, as he as says in, in the punishment of eternal fire. So I read all those things so that you guys could kind of get a snapshot of this doctrine of hell. It's in scripture. It's going to happen. And this is why we need to take this seriously. And why we need to take our call as Christians seriously. When we share the gospel and bring people to repentance and to faith in Christ, what ultimately we're doing is that we are snatching them from the fires of eternal punishment. And this is actually what it says in a couple cross-references that I'd like to read. In James chapter 5, near the very end of the book, it says, My brethren, if any among you strays from the truth and one turns him back to the truth, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Now, the death that he's talking about is the eternal death, the eternal punishment. We turn someone back from the error of their ways, back to the truth. We literally save them from hell. And if we continued looking in Jude, because we were looking at verses 6 and 7, if we continued down to verses 20 through 23, this is what it says. 
But you, beloved, building yourselves up on the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. And have mercy on some who are doubting. We as Christians need to have mercy on some who are doubting. Save others, snatching them out of the fire. So we may have mercy on some of those who are doubting, right? We, we deal with them with mercy. But others we save, right? We, we literally need to go and save them, snatching them from the fires. And then on others, have mercy with fear, hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. We as believers are called to give the gospel to the world. And this is why. The gospel is meaningless if people are saved from nothing. If there's no judgment, if there's no wrath, if there's no consequence, for unrighteousness, then we are literally saved from nothing and we're not saved. And this is something that is not taught enough in Christianity. We want people to recognize that God is a God of justice and mercy and grace and love, but we ignore what the justice points to. This is the justice. This is his wrath. And we need to save people from that. And that is why, church, we are given the Great Commission. We go out into the world and we make disciples who love God and love others. Not just so that we can have community. Not just so we can gather together on a Sunday morning and sing and worship and have fellowship and love one another. Yeah, we're supposed to do that. But we share the gospel to save people from the lake of fire. And that ultimately is what matters the most. If we do nothing on this earth except save one person from hell, our life will have had meaning for eternity. I want you guys to grasp that. The consequences of us sharing the gospel with someone who is not saved, are eternal. Ultimately, it's their choice. They can choose to accept the free gift that has been given, just as we have, or reject it. And if you have not made that choice yet, if you're sitting here today and you have not accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want you to understand that the the Bible is describing to you the eternal consequences of not choosing Jesus Christ. This is not game playing. This is not analogy. This is not myth. This is eternity in the lake of fire. And I want you guys to recognize that that this is for real. A lot of people want to say that this is not, this is just whatever. They don't, they, they don't want to take the consequences seriously. I promise you, when all this is taking place, we're going to see very quickly that this is real. This is the testimony of the saints, how the devil is overcome. It is also the reason why the dragon goes and makes war against the church. This is the reason why, because the dragon wants to take as many people with him as possible. And so he makes war against the church because the church is actively opposed to his plan, to his purpose. There's a section here in Romans chapter eight. I just want to read this really quick. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared 
with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Though the devil may wage war against the church, it is nothing compared to eternity in the presence of our God. And though we may experience persecution in this life, in this country, we really haven't experienced that yet. But all around the world, Christians are being persecuted for their faith. And some of them are dying for their faith in the Middle East, in Africa, in, in um, the Far East. There are literally people dying for their faith in Christ. But this, we're told, is the blessing. I'm going to end with a reading in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. This is, this is where we're going to end because I want you guys to recognize that no matter what happens in this life, eternity is what matters. This is what Paul says to the church in Thessalonica. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brethren, as is only fitting, because your faith is greatly enlarged and the love of each one of you toward one another grows ever greater. Therefore, we ourselves speak proudly of you among the churches of God for your perseverance and faith in the midst of all your persecutions and afflictions which you endure. This is a plain indication of God's righteous judgment so that you will be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which indeed you are suffering. For after all, it is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to give relief to you who are afflicted and to us as well when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes to be glorified in his saints on that day and to be marveled at among all who have believed for our testimony to you was believed.